Let us pray. Oh, Lord, what a morning. Oh, Lord, what a morning. Lord, we come before you today to worship you, to celebrate you, to sing you praise, to speak with you in prayer, to hear your scriptures, and to watch them be sealed in the waters of baptism. Our Lord and our God, you were greeting us today when we walked in the door. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. It's in the name of the triune God of grace that we pray. Amen. Our Lord Jesus welcomes you to his house today, and I greet you in his holy name. Few announcements um, as we uh, head into this busy season of Lent, which began on Wednesday evening. Uh, first of all, an important notice pertaining to Sunday school, starting next Sunday and every Sunday leading to Easter, um, Sunday school will be focusing on Easter, the meaning of Easter, the different things that happen to help the kids understand and process what it is that they are seeing, what they are experiencing, what they are hearing um, in worship and at home and in Sunday school. So, um, so if uh, just mark it on your calendars, make sure that uh, you get your kids here because I think it will be a very, very important um, series of lessons on Easter. Lenten Reflections pick up this Wednesday night. Um, we are taking advantage of the fact that we have a student intern from seminary. So uh, Melanie will be, she has developed and is leading each one of the Wednesday evening Lenten Reflections. They start at 6.30. So um, you are welcome to join her. Um, I will be here, but try to try, also try to be very, very obscure because this is her deal. In fact, if you notice, we have these candles. This is Melanie's doing, okay? And, um, and hopefully, because um, she's out preaching at another church today, hopefully I will remember at the end that I have to shut off one of those candles, okay? So if I don't, um, yell at me, shut off the candle, um, because each week, um, as we progress toward Easter, we will shut a candle off at the end of the service. The last candle will go dark on Good Friday at the end of that service. Okay? So, very symbolic, because um, we like gadgets around here. Especially me. Um, let's see, what else do we have? The next seven Sunday nights down at Hackettstown Church, um, they're having, or actually, I guess it is, yes, from five to eight and starting tonight, um, what they call Ultimate Youth Night, and this is for um, fifth to eighth graders. And um, so it is, but it is a group of churches that are doing this together. Scott is one of the contacts for this, I believe, in my notes. Did you know that? Okay, you just found out. From me or from somebody else? So, so Scott is one of the contacts, or see Sandra in, in the narthex. She also has that. Today is, again, the first Sunday of Lent, so you'll find in the narthex a basket full of those infernal, difficult-to-assemble fish banks. We ask you to take one, especially kids, and fill those banks with spare change, throughout the Lenten season because they go toward three different ministries, Presbyterian Hunger Relief, Presbyterian Disaster Relief, and, and um, Self-Development of People. They are there, um, and there are also envelopes if you don't want to try to assemble one of those banks. Every year I have to wrestle with one, and there is one assembled, and if you take it, you know that Pastor Pat had his hands on that bank. So they are due back by Palm Sunday, okay? So fill them up. Um, it's one of the few extra offerings we do every year, but it is certainly for a worthy cause. Also out there is a basket full of Lenten dev devotionals. If you look at it, you say, hey, I did this one last year. Well, no, there's some new ones there. But we also are trying to get rid of the inventory of the year, last year, the year before. Anything we had on the shelf is in that basket. So for those of you who have never taken a Lenten devotional and done it during the Lenten season, as a family devotional, um, 
you can take any one of them, it'll be brand new to you. So um, there are plenty of them out there though. Uh, also putting you on notice that the uh, Educational Trust Fund applications are now in the office. Um, this is for high schoolers heading off to college um, who are active in the congregation. Um, it's also uh, available, although uh, since I've been here, it's only happened once, and that's with Melanie. Um, it's also available for those who are pursuing ministry and going to school. So those scholarship fund applications are there. Last but not least, um, put on your calendars March 24th. That is soup night. You'll hear more about that from the membership council co-chair next week. Um, but it's soup night. Not only are you allowed to eat, you are allowed to make. So the more soup, the merrier. And my son is try trying to twist my arm because I was like, eh, I'm just not feeling it making soup this year. He's making Italian wedding soup. I am not going to make pasta fazool because I've made it way too many times. But maybe there's a little seafood stew in the mix. Let us quiet our hearts. And let us hear from God through the voice of Isaiah. You were wearied with the length of your way, but you did not say it is hopeless. You found new life for your strength, and so you were not faint. Come, let us worship our God. From now on, 
Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. Lord, we start today with a thank you. We thank you for giving us a season developed starting in the early church, a season of preparation. 
Back in the early days, it was a season of preparation for those who were about to make the commitment to be followers of Christ. And at the end of that season, on Easter morning, they would receive baptism. But that season of, that would eventually be called Lent, that season of Lent has been with us all these years. And it is a wonderful time to be able to walk with you, to reflect, to recommit. On Wednesday night, Lord, those assembled here reaffirmed their baptismal vows. And today, we have parents who take baptismal vows for their child. The beginning of a journey, the beginning of a new life, but also a renewal of our lives. So Lord, we thank you for inviting us into this season and may we step up to the task. A task of renewal. Part of that, Lord, is an extra attentiveness to worship and to prayer for acts of good deeds, for almsgiving. All of that, Lord, is wrapped into this season because how we live is the great reaction and the great thankfulness for what you did on the cross 2,000 years ago. So Lord, on this day, which you know, you know the pains and the struggles and the grief, the sickness, be it physical, mental, spiritual, but also the joys and the celebrations, new births and rebirths. The millions of little miracles that happen all day long that go unnoticed by us. For this, we all, all of this, we give you thanks. We give you praise. And we honor you by together, with one voice, with one heart, bound by the Holy Spirit. We pray the words you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, you'll hear me talk a little bit about miracles in a few minutes, but the fact is, is that the miracle... There were so many little miracles that happened to us over the last three years. And one of those is we've never had to pass the plate. That tradition where people love to have the plate go pew to pew to pew. We don't have to do that anymore. For we have a basket. We have the internet. We have the U.S. mail. And your gifts deliver which symbolizes our ability to do ministry with Jesus Christ and with one another in the world. Today we give thanks for that as we ponder that and as we listen.
Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, what more can we say? You are our creator. We are, your, we are the created. You are the redeemer. We are the redeemed. You are the inspirer. We are the inspired. Triune God of grace, we offer up to you our very lives, the produce of our lives. Take it all and multiply it, Lord. And multiply us because there's a lot of work to be done in your name. And it's in the name of the triune God of grace that we pray. Amen. They're coming. They didn't even have to be asked. They are coming. You know, it just occurred to me as I was sitting there thinking about this. Both your boys are single syllable names. I love that. That's why I shortened my name to Pat. Madison, you got your little brother here. How cool is that? He's got eyes on his sweater. More to come. Here they come. You guys can come up. It was Emma, right? Ava. Ava. Ava, come on up. Come on. You're not too old. Neither are you. Come on. This is called Pastor Pat throwing filler out there. What grade are you in? Fifth grade? That's not too old. Fifth grade was the longest three years of my life. You try being a 13-year-old in fifth grade. Guys, make a little room because here comes the treasure chest. I'm going to reach over you. Don't drop it. Oh, my goodness, I can't drop it. There's heads there. I know, it's a little crowded today, but that's okay, because the, the big kids were just up here playing with their bells. That's why, okay? So it's a little crowded, but that's okay. Crowded is good, because I was, I was just telling somebody before church that three years ago, when there were like five of us in this room, except for a whole bunch of pictures on pews, let me tell you, I'll take this any day of the week. Hi! Hi! <laughs> Finally, let's see. Mm. Okay. You're going to have to help me. What is this? A cross. Oh, okay. But is it, is it a special cross? Why is it special, this one? Because it represents Jesus. Well, it re without a doubt, every cross represents Jesus, and I like that. But is this, like, is this one of those, like, hang on to prayer type crosses that you can put in your hand? It is, isn't it? You can hang on to the cross, and you can hang on because the cross represents Jesus. You can hang on to Jesus. That's, I, that's why this one has the special rounded so it doesn't give you splinters. And it's, and it's nice and comfortable in your hand. You can hold it right here and you can pray to Jesus with Jesus' cross right in your hand. People forget that sometimes. I think a lot of times people just even forget to pray. Even whether they have one of these or not, they forget. This season's about not forgetting. Every single day, every single day, hey, I'll make a rhyme. Every single day, I want you to pray. Not just at dinner, because sometimes we do that, and sometimes that becomes a habit. I want you to just sit down for a minute, just think about Jesus, try to see his face, and then talk to him. If it's at the beginning of the day, ask him to help you have a good day. If it's at the end of the day, thank, thank him for letting you have a good day. Even if you don't think it was such a great day. Because the fact of the matter is, is at the end of the day, even if it's a bad day, it's a good day. 
because he's been with you the whole time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I have your cross in my hand and I have your face in my mind and I have your love in my heart. My prayer is this Lenten season, all of the children in this room, be they in elementary or middle school or be they in retirement and everywhere in between, may they step up their prayers to you. May they talk to you, Jesus, because I know you're waiting to hear from everybody. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right. Boy, I'm glad I knew what that was. <laughs> Let's see. Oh. I can't say your name. I can't say your name. You can't say my name? I got a boo-boo. Oh, you've got a boo-boo, so you can't say my name. Is he going to be here next week? All right. Danny, take it. And all of you. Oh, we got it. He, he got it. <laughs> Get out of here. Tell me, tell me after church. Okay. He's telling me about his prayer that he says at school. Oh. Oh, right. Thank you. Wow. Cool. I'm glad to see somebody's teaching prayer at school. Oh, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. <laughs> so as we head into our two scriptures, our parallel scriptures today, both written by Luke, one in the Gospel of Luke and the other in the book of Acts, um, you'll very quickly see the theme. First, we're with Jesus. Soon afterward, Jesus went to the town called Nain. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. And then he came up and he touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man... I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up, and he began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. That's all right, I got you. <laughs> now to Peter. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas or a gazelle. She was full of good works and acts of charity. And in those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon 
a tanner. Something started happening to the church about 300 years ago. The culture in Western Europe and the culture in North America um, was starting to change. And as the culture changed, we had this offshoot of the long-running Renaissance known as the Enlightenment. Now, part of the problem with the Enlightenment is, and it really wasn't a problem at first, was to start adding reason in. But of course, you had the development of the scientific method. You had all kinds of things happening at the same time. But what happened was, and what began, and what continues to this day, is a cynicism. A, lo a loss of the mystical. Everything has to be solved. If it's not, if it's not, if you're not able to Google it on the internet, then by golly, it must not exist. It must not be real. Yes, I'm being a little tongue in cheek in there. You, 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 you're more than you can smile. But the fact of the matter is, is that mystery went away, and as mystery started to go away, they stopped believing in the mystical, the mystery. They stopped believing in miracles. We stopped believing in miracles. Because of that, and as a result of that, we started to lose hope. Because after all, all those miracles that David Hume said were just basically um, mass hysteria, David Hume was a philosopher in the 1700s who believed that um, anything having to do with Miracles in the Bible, it was just people imagining things. It was mass, it was a mass, I don't know, illusion. So all of a sudden, we stopped believing, not all of us, but many stopped believing in reanimation. The fact that a dead body could come back to life. I dare say that some in this room probably believe that. I am not one of them. When I see these two stories, the young man dead, who had been taking from his widow mother her sole substance, the one who was to care for her in that culture because her husband was dead, so it defaults to your son, and the son takes care of her, and now, now, she needs to be rescued. Let me say that again. She needs to be rescued. The resurrection that Jesus performs that day on that young man was to rescue his mother. Why else? Would that detail be in there? You see, because resurrection isn't about the one who's coming back to life, the one who is reanimated. It is about those who are left behind because they need hope. They need rescue from themselves, from society, from sin. They need rescue. And lo and behold, Jesus spots this dead body being carried out in a funeral procession, and he stops it. Now imagine Jesus stopping on Main Street as the cars are ready to pull into the cemetery here and saying, hang on a second here, and he walks up to the hearse. Everybody would think he was nuts. I dare say I think they thought he was nuts back then too, but they stopped, maybe because he was standing in the road. But he walks up, he touches the buyer, which is just an old fancy, it's, that's basically the hearse. These guys were carrying him, the pallbearers, stopped the thing in its track, and then commands the young man to rise. 
And then it says, he gave the young man to his mother. Think about that. Think about that. This story is for the living, not the dead. Move a number of years later, here comes the great fisherman. He's been asked to come because a lady, apparently of the church, apparently known, somebody who does great works by the name of Tabitha. I love the fact that um, Dorcas is translated gazelle. I love that. When I was in high school, Dorcas meant something completely different. It was usually somebody I hung around with. Gazelle. And the gazelle does good works. And she's well loved by people. And she has died. She's got her entourage around her of widows who are just devastated that she has died. Peter comes in in such an intimate moment. First, he puts everybody out. And then he sits by her bed and he prays. He prays. He's not, I don't believe, praying for Tabitha. I think he's actually praying for all those people who he's going to introduce her to or reintroduce her to when the whole situation is over. He tells Tabitha to arise, and she rises. And he takes her by the hand, and he lifts her up, and he brings her out, and he presents her to all of these people, and they are, it says, amazed. They are filled with glory because of what they have seen. You see, I'm not sure this resurrection is for Tabitha. I think this resurrection is for the church that's going to be, the people who are going to believe. It says that they are, they believe. It happens, and the church expands. So if we don't believe that God has the power to resurrect somebody from the dead... Well, work it in your head. Then we don't have hope. We don't have hope that is in a promise that's still contained in Scripture that someday Jesus will return, and when he does, the dead shall rise, and the living shall join them, and they will all be together with him. If there is no resurrection, people, that doesn't happen. It's a lie. It's a myth. I believe in resurrection. A number of years ago, when I was still working in my other career, Janice and I and the kids belonged to a church in southeastern Pennsylvania. And there was this really, really amazing, sweet lady um, I'll call her Tabitha, but her name was Rebecca. This was a woman who went on multiple mission trips around the world, touched many lives, was full of love. Her and her husband, Glenn, were amazing. Glenn was one of the elders. He was just such a special person. We're on a men's retreat, and the phone call comes interrupting the retreat. We'd just been there just a few hours. We had had dinner, we had had worship service, and afterward we were getting ready to start this weekend retreat, all the men together at a local camp, and a phone call comes that Rebecca, who had been sick all week long with a cold, was being rushed to the hospital. Out the door, Glenn went with our pastor. Boom, they were gone. We instantaneously went into prayer. Phone calls were made to spouses back home for prayer. 
because Rebecca was being transported to the hospital. The news that came at about midnight that night was that she had pneumonia and had gone septic. She wasn't going to make it through the night. But we prayed. And women gathered at the church and prayed. And a bunch of people gathered in the waiting room at the hospital and prayed. Andy was there, our pastor, along with Glenn, and they prayed. The doctors are like, we have no choice. She's not going to make it through the night. But we're going to put her in a chemically induced coma. But we don't think she's going to make it through the night. The next morning, she was still there. And they said, well, we don't think she's going to make it through the week. And the prayer continued. Just like Peter sitting next to the bed, the prayer continued. By the end of the week, she was still there, but they said, okay, there's a chance she might live, a slim chance, but she's definitely going to lose her legs. And she kept on living. And a week later, well, she may lose her legs from the knees down. Because if anybody understands sepsis, it means the bacteria has coursed through the entire body and it's attacking every organ system. They thought that maybe she wasn't going to have functioning kidneys. They thought that none of this was going to happen. More time went by. Well, she may lose her feet, but she's definitely not losing her kidneys. And then it was, oh, she's going to lose her toes. When all was said and done, Rebecca lost just a little bit of the tip of one of her toes. Symbolizing, if you think about it, necrosis or death. One little tip of a toe. Within the year, Rebecca was in Colombia on a mission trip. I believe in miracles. I believe in resurrection. But I also believe that it is not, wasn't for Rebecca. It was for the church. And it was for the doctors and the nurses who were amazed at what had happened to Rebecca. It was amazing how the fire just started and it spread. And it, believe it or not, in the heat of that fire, interestingly enough, is when I started to discern my call to ministry. Walking on a path with my mentor, his name was Charles, who's since gone on to the Lord, and I said to Charles, something's happening to me. Something's been happening to me, and I don't know what it is, but since my father-in-law died, something's going on in me. So, what I'm saying is, you're all part of Rebecca's miracle. Well, some of you are still trying to figure out after 10 years whether I'm a miracle or not. But it's not about me. It's about us. Because miracles like these resurrection stories are not about the people who were dead. It's about the people who are alive and how they live their lives and what do they do with the grateful response of salvation. Because every one of us who's ever declared that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and meant it have been reborn, have been renewed, are alive, and we're called to life, not death, life. But because of what has happened with the Enlightenment, we also are afraid of death. Don't be afraid of death. It's not the final answer. This I know for the Bible tells me so. So here we are in the season where the other night, coming in the door, people had ashes placed on their forehead. And before they left, they came up to this very baptismal font that we're going to use here in about five minutes. This very font. And they dipped their hand in the water and they drew out a bead. And then they stepped and they wiped off the mark from their forehead. So when they came in, they carried the ashes of their sin from the past year. And when they left, they were reminded that they no longer have to carry the ashes. 
and they entered out into the world and into the Lenten season. And here, is, here we are. So what I'm telling you today is, from these wonderful stories that we are getting about these two powerful miracles, plus the powerful miracle of Rebecca, and all of this, what I'm saying to you today is, let's be in awe this Lenten season. Let's be reanimated ourselves. Let us be new ourselves. Let us be alive. What a wonderful time to be alive. Because there's a lot of people who are afraid of death. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in God. This is our time to be alive. I just thought about this. I actually almost sounded like an old Frankenstein movie. It's alive! It's alive! Yes, we're alive! What a great time to be alive. And what do you get to do with the word that you've been given today? Now we get to watch it sealed. We get to watch it sealed. Because in the Calvinist tradition, for which I am, and so glad that Melanie is training up in, in the Calvinist tradition, to take on the sign of faith and to take it on for your household is a powerful symbol of how you now shall live. We get to do it, like Abraham did, with all of the people in his tribe, including his little one, Ishmael. When God says, hey, Abraham, guess what I'm going to have you do? I'm going to have you take on a sign. Let me tell you, folks, it was not water. It was a piece of flesh. But we are blessed by the fact that all we have to do is come to the waters. How beautiful is that? But it's about family, too. Because we will have parents making a commitment. We will have godparents making a commitment. We will have an entire church family making a commitment. How cool is that? Drew, what a wonderful time to be alive. He's out cold. He has no idea what's coming. So let us, let us do this. So I call forth at this point, Leanna and Jared, and yes, Chase, you can come. And Jason and Melissa, you can come too. And my lovely assistant, Doug, you can come too. The sacrament of baptism was instituted by Jesus Christ as a sign and seal of the covenant binding us with the triune God of grace and to each other, to one another as people, people of faith. Jesus commanded that disciples be brought to the triune God of grace so that they can be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they are to be discipled. Additionally, as circumcision was for Israel, a sign of this covenant, baptism is not only for those who believe, but for their children as well. For the effectiveness of this sacrament is not tied to a moment of time, but rather to the effects of the Holy Spirit over time. On behalf of the session, I present Jared and Leanna Butella. Uh, members of the First Presbyterian Church of Sparta, as they bring their child, Drew Raymond Butala, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Leanna and Jared, you have requested to have Drew baptized in the Church of Jesus Christ. 
Is it your intention to do so now? If so, say we do. So pastor likes to do research when he's given names. So the first name that this child bears, Drew, which is also shortened from Andrew, it can be, it, they tell us something. Drew means courageous. Boy, if there was ever a time for a child to be born and two parents who do what you two do in the nursing community, courageous is the word. Aptly named. But also, this kid is going to change minds because his middle name is Raymond. Raymond means protected counsel. Who knows? Maybe he will be my counselor someday as I lay on a couch and he talks to me about the demented life I've lived. <laughs> Jared and Leanna, as you are Drew's parents, this action is not just about his future faith, but about your present faith and intentions. So I ask you, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Just like that night you became members. Absolutely. Do you promise to raise Drew before Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, and within the body of Christ, providing a Christian home until such a time that Drew embraces and declares for himself his own faith in the triune God of grace? Listen, Jason, you have a special task. You've been asked to walk alongside mom and dad, okay? And if anything befalls this child, which I hope, I hope not, her parents, his parents, I mean, you have a sacred responsibility, but also to show them and to show him what it means to be gracious and kind and full of love and being there and supporting them and praying for all of them. Are you willing to do that? I have some questions for the congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, <clears throat> do you promise to do everything in your power to support Liana and Jared as they raise Drew before Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, and will you be for him the body of Christ? If so, Say we do. we do. Will you pray for Drew, Leanna, and Jared, and be examples to Drew walking with him and before him in the way of Christ? If so, say, with the help of God, we will. With the help of God, we will. <clears throat> will you love Drew and inspire him to take his place within the life and worship of Christ's church? If so, say with the help of God, we will. Seeing that these promises have been made, let us now prepare for the baptism of Drew Raymond Butala, who's completely out cold. And we will baptize him in the name, powerful name of the triune God of grace. Chase, put your hand in here and tell me if it's still warm. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, as we come to the baptismal font and we have poured the water into this bowl, we know how powerful a symbol water is. For it was over the waters of creation that your spirit stirred those waters. Water played such a significant role in the life of Moses, 
whose name bears the intonations of water. But we also know, Lord, that it was water of the Jordan for which you were baptized. And it was water that flowed from your side from the cross. Lord, stir this water now. Stir this water up with your Holy Spirit and make it a special water for this moment. And may your Spirit infuse us all with your power as we begin Drew's journey together as a congregation, as a church family, as extended family. It's in the powerful name of the resurrected one, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Oh, baby, are you ready for this? So mom gently put his head over the bowl. Drew Raymond, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, child who has more hair than me. <laughs> may you grow strong physically. May you grow strong mentally. But most importantly, may you grow strong spiritually. With the help of the Holy Spirit of the triune God of grace, we ask you to just live and live well and learn and watch and see what we're doing, Drew. May the passion fire move to you so that someday you may stand before this congregation, but any congregation of Jesus Christ, and say those precious words, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. All right, my turn. <laughs> Folks, you, yo, we have done so few of these, and most of the ones we've done over the last three years were done in private. Either, you know, in this sanctuary, me and an elder representing you guys. But today, you're all here. You're all here to see this. This little man who hopefully will be taught by his older brother to be mischievous with love. <laughs> so, my friends, welcome Drew Raymond into this church family. Do you notice the swing? Isn't it amazing? It's like DNA. You put a baby in your hands and you start to roll. And man, I can't believe you didn't make a squawk. Something tells me there are going to be plenty of squawks coming now. That's okay. I can out scream you, I can out preach you, and I can out amen you. Welcome aboard, little man. Remember that there is a time of fellowship next door in Pearson Hall. Remember Sunday school is meeting. Remember that there is two adult studies, one in the parlor that outprocesses the sermon and the other as, we, as I cover um, the confessions of our faith. So let us prepare to close out this worship and go out into the world.
is at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at the center of my life. Jesus be the center of the beauties of having um, Karen first and then Debbie for me over the last 10 years is they come up with these songs out of the middle of nowhere. I came to a church 10 years ago that laid the claim in its mission statement to say that they were Christ-centered. He's the center of the reanimation of our lives. For those of you visiting with us today, if you have a church, a home church, go spread this madness to them during the Lenten season. Go back to them and spread it. And I don't care, Baptist, Catholic, Pentecostal, it doesn't matter. Go and live the reanimated life. All of you who are here in the coming weeks, I'll be looking for it because we're alive. We're alive. Look for miracles. Look to be mystified. You don't have to have all the answers. Jesus has them. Just live and live well. As you go out into the world, you never, ever, ever go alone. You always go with one another. You always go with the Lord, and you always go with a blessing. For Christ goes before you. Christ is behind you. Christ walks to the sides of you. Christ is within you. Go out in the world and look for the face of Christ. Listen for the voice of Christ. Experience the spirit of Christ. I bless you in the name of the triune God of grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hallelujah.